Is Liberty Dying Where You Live? Escape to Keen at freekeen.com. Mr. Lauren, talk over how we're going to go through this today. Yes, sir. Yes, Your Honor. It's your motion, I guess. I didn't talk about these guys. I was intending to call, um, call our witnesses. And I understand Dave wants to make a brief argument first. Okay. Is there anything to question? Yeah, the witnesses are being sequestered. Uh, yes, well, Your Honor, my understanding is the defendants do not have to, I advise that they do not have to physically present. Okay. Mr. Decky is in, resides in Arizona. I don't know him. Uh, I only have two uh, notices regarding uh, cameras. I see two cameras and I see someone with a handheld, so we need to have somebody. He's with me. Pardon me? He's with me through okay. free press publications, FBP.com. Okay, so you're, you're under the same? Yes. Okay. Uh, you have to. You, yeah, you have to stay where you are. Yeah, right? hey, he, he's going to stay here. I'm staying here. Okay. All right. Uh, Mr. Mayor said you want to say something first before uh, I Yes, Your Honor. At the outset, the state would like to uh, raise a legal point. The state has uh, seven witnesses and is ready to proceed with all seven. But the state would uh, like to raise an argument that uh, we may not even need to uh, go that far. The defendants are charged with criminal trespass and not contempt. The, there are three elements to criminal trespass. First, the defendants knowingly to enter or remain in any place in defiance of an order to leave or not to enter. And three, said order having been personally communicated to them by the owner or other authorized person. And there are three elements to contempt. A valid court order covering the defendant exists, the defendant had notice of the order, and the defendant intentionally committed acts in violation of that order. As shown by the elements of each, with contempt, the state has to prove that there was a valid order. With criminal trespass, however, Your Honor, the state only has to prove that it was an order made by an authorized or valid person who in the instant case was the sheriff of Cheshire County. And under criminal trespass, there is no element that the state prove uh, or that it has to show that the order was valid. The state would argue that after having been served with the order in the instant case, uh, an order that the defendant felt was invalid, their remedy was to bring an action in superior court to invalidate it and not to simply violate it. And in the instant case, the underlying charge is criminal trespass and not contempt. The focus is not really on the validity of the order, but rather the owner uh, or uh, of the uh, property uh, was authorized to serve the order. And in the instant case, the defendants were given the order not to enter Cheshire County Superior Court by a duly authorized person, the sheriff of Cheshire County, and then they knowingly violated that order. And so, again, the state would argue that there really is no need for this honorable court to hold an evidentiary hearing on whether the no trespass order is valid or not, and rather should look to the elements of the crime for which the defendants are charged and uh, indicate that the, uh, uh, in this case, the uh, remedy, again, is for the defendant to go to Superior Court and file a uh, motion uh, for uh, you know, a hearing to be heard on the uh, merits of the validity of that order. And uh, the uh, state would, uh, uh, therefore, uh, request that this honorable court uh, hold uh, this uh, case in abeyance and uh, uh, order that the uh, defendants hold, hold uh, it in abeyance. Uh, well, not rule on the uh, 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 not have this hearing, uh, not rule on the uh, in 
against the charge, and uh, if the defendants wish to uh, argue the uh, validity of the order itself, that needs to be done over at Superior Court. Well, when did you know you were going to make this motion? Uh, that uh, was uh, raised uh, peripherally in the state's uh, uh, answer and objection to... Well, you're making it directly. <coughs> How much notice did Mr. Meyer have? With, um... Well, he had notice from the perspective of uh, having it in uh, referenced in the state's answer and objection. Your Honor, I don't really need advance notice to address okay. uh, this issue, right. although I, I would request that the permission to file a <coughs> memorandum afterwards just like so provide the court with citations. Uh, I think Attorney Lawrence made two points. Um, one is that a criminal trespass statute does not require a valid order. And second is that the defendants must challenge the validity of the order prior to violating it. Now, the first of the two points is just completely incorrect. I mean, a criminal trespass order is dependent. I mean, a criminal trespass conviction is, is dependent upon uh, there, being, there being a valid order. Uh, I mean, otherwise, otherwise it's, not, it's not criminal trespass. If, if the sheriff didn't have the legal and constitutional authority to issue the order, the banning order that he did, um, but I, I think the more important point is the second point, which is the argument that before a defendant can, um, that rather than challenging an order through a criminal defense proceeding, you need to first attack the challenge of civil, civilly before the violation of the order. And, and I guess I have two responses to that. First of all, this order was challenged civilly. Now, David said it has to be filed challenged in Superior Court. I'm not quite sure where he got that from. It has to be. It was challenged civilly in this court. Uh, the same order uh, in a case called State v. Bodates. Uh, it was challenged as a civil, essentially a civil matter, order from the court to allow him to attend hearings without getting permission of the sheriff. Um, that order. Actually, I said it, no. It was. It was. Sorry, my my mistake. It was challenged. It wasn't Superior Court. It was. There was someplace along the line. I saw an yeah. order or a decision from Judge McGuire. Right, Judge McGuire, February 15, 2012. Which, which ironically, up until now, the, um, the prosecution has relied upon is showing that the order is valid. So, that in, in fact, this same order was challenged civilly in court, in Superior Court, and upheld. So, so the argument is really lacks a factual premise. But, but secondly, the, as a matter of federal law, when dealing with this issue, the, the United States First Circuit of Court of Appeals, in a case called the United States um, v. Morad, which is a case from 2002. How does that spell? Uh, and I'll, I'll provide the site in a subsequent memorandum. But essentially what the court said is that although it is the normal rule that a order of this type should first be challenged civilly before being violated, that there is an exception where the order is transparently invalid. And, and our position is that this order is transparently invalid. So that order would be applicable here, uh, even if, again, the, if, even, if, even if this hadn't been challenged civilly, which it has been. Now, the final point in, in terms of the David's argument that the, the shouldn't be an evidentiary hearing is it, sort of counterintuitive because the evidentiary hearing was, the reason we're having this hearing is at his request. In other words, it's the prosecution that has asked this court for leave to put in testimony. And, and the reason for the hearing today, I mean, our position is that this order is, is invalid um, as a matter of law. Um, the prosecution has sought to sustain the order through the introduction of testimony the court scheduled the hearing for today, uh, so I can imagine no conceivable reason um, to defer the delay of this proceeding. Your Honor, just very briefly, uh, regarding uh, Attorney Meyer's first argument regarding uh, the criminal trespass uh, dependent upon there being a valid order, the plain language of the statute does not provide that. 
as opposed to the contempt statute. So what's, what, which what, does. what is a defendant to do if, let's say that, first of all, let's say there's no state action involved. Okay? Let's say it's, uh, some landlord has some uh, agent and they say, we don't want you to trespass. And, and, the, and the agent delivers a letter to, to a, somebody down the street that they don't want trespassing on the property anymore. But let's say the agent really isn't an agent. Let's say somebody just took it on their own to, to, uh, to, to, to give somebody a no trespass letter and said this is from the landlord. And I've got the authority. How does it, what, what does the defendant do? Go to Superior Court and challenge that? Well, they go to court to, um, in the first instance, to challenge the validity of the... Uh, of, uh, no, defendant... defendant Defendant challenges it within the within the confines of the, of the criminal case he's charged with. You don't have a separate case on that, and I don't see how it would be any different here. I understand your argument, but I don't, I don't see how how the I mean the, the reasonableness, the, the, the validity, and the constitutionality of the order are are I think right for, for this court to entertain the evidence on that. It's the defendant's motion. I don't know. Did, did, you, did you say you were going to put on witnesses? Uh, yes. Well. The, the, um, the point is, yes, the defendant is, is going to call, uh, the court's prepared, is going to call uh, as its first witness. Um, well, I'm, I'm inclined to go ahead. I mean, I, I think you, your, your issue is still preserved, but I think we're going to have to go forward with, with the evidence as, as we plan to do it today. And, but, and the, you, you'll each do a memorandum on that, I guess? Sure. Very good. Thank you, Your Honor. Okay. Your Honor, defendant calls, defendants call as their first witness Richard Foote. Please raise your right hand. Sir, affirm anything you say will be the truth. Yes. Mr. Foote, I'm warning. My name is John Meyer. I'm the attorney for the defendants. Good morning. And sir, what is your position? I'm the sheriff. And in your capacity as sheriff, did you issue an order um, directed to uh, Mr. Freeman? Uh, I, I mean, Mr. Bernard and Ms. Sneadecki? Yes. And what was the substance of that order? I don't have it uh, verbatim, but basically it was to prevent them from uh, <coughs> coming into the court without our knowing about it. Sir, is that a copy of the order that you issued? It appears to be, yes. And <coughs> that order is addressed to an Ian Bernard. And, and Mr. Bernard is the gentleman next to me? Yes. And was that same order uh, also addressed to other individuals? Yes. How many other individuals? I think there were four others. And um, <coughs> Who drafted that order? This is uh, basically an order that the uh, county uses for other county buildings. So it came from the county administration. From the county administration. Have you ever used that order with respect to the Superior Courthouse before? <coughs> no, I have not. And who made the decision to issue this order? I did. And who did you consult in making that decision, if anybody? Uh, nobody. You made it on your own without consultation? Yes. <coughs> now, you said that that order was issued to a total of five individuals, is that correct? I believe so, yes. And how did you, who determined which individuals were going to be served with that order? Uh, the people that showed up and uh, were harassing the uh, uh, the court staff as they were leaving. Now, who and made the decision which individuals were going to be uh, served with that order? That's why. That's we, we watched the people that were No, but who that. made that decision? The question was, who made the decision? I did. Okay. And on what basis did you make that decision? I made that decision because it appeared to me as watching on the videos uh, and, and some experience with the activity of the same individuals uh, prior to this where they were um, 
harassing the people that were leaving the court uh, after a particular court case that was heard. The, they were harassing the Superior Court staff and they were harassing the judge. On uh, two occasions, um, or I had to send deputies out to intervene between uh, Mr. Bernard and, and the other four um, so that people could get in their cars and do so with safety. And also with the judge when he came back, came out the back door to get in his car, it was the same way. And that happened twice, and then they started, they kept coming back, in the, and after to prevent them from coming back and still terrorizing the people, I, uh, I made the order. I asked them to leave the property when they were out there doing it, and then and walked them off the property with the other bailiffs, with the other deputies, and then the order came out. When they came back the next day, the orders were issued. Sir, are you familiar with the criminal harassment statute? Vaguely, yes. Vaguely? Well, right off the top of my head, yeah. You're aware that there is a criminal statute that can be, that individuals can be subject to for engaging in criminal harassment? Yes. Were any of the individuals charged, in this case, were any of the individuals subject to this order charged with criminal harassment? No, they weren't. Has there been any finding that any of the individuals subject to this order have engaged in any criminal acts? They didn't come, oh, yeah. Has there been a finding? I'm, no. I'm, I'm losing you here. Could you ask your question again? I'm sorry. Has there been a, was there any determination made by your office that oh, any okay, by my office? Please let me finish the question, sir. Was there any determination made by yourself that makes it more specific? Did any of the individuals subject to this order had engaged in any criminal activity? I'm not sure what, uh, um, why we're here. I mean, that's somebody's been charged with it. No. Violating they, this order. They have been charged with violating the order. I'm asking not about. I'm asking about the prior to the issuance of the order. Was any determination made that any of these individuals engaged in criminal activity? Do, uh, you mean at, at the site or or anywhere? At the site or in, in or around the courthouse. Um, I don't know whether, right off the top of my head, I don't remember who they were, but they were, we've had, we've arrested people for uh, conduct within the courthouse for violating the judge's <coughs> order, and, and uh, so that's, that has happened, whether or not, I don't remember off the top of my head whether it specifically it was one of these, but I know that that group of people had been involved with that. I you that group of people? The people that were, that group of five that were, were here. I don't know how well it's described. Uh, well, let's be more specific. In terms of Mr. Freeman, okay. what did he do to justify your issuing order banning him from the courthouse? And not in the courthouse, but from any property of the court related to the courthouse. Uh, showing up in, in my opinion, he was harassing or interfering, interfering with the uh, court staff that was leaving uh, when they left after work, after there was a court case where there was a finding, um, and that they kept coming back to that, and then they, for at least a third day, I don't remember exactly, uh, kept coming back, and my focus was to remove them from that area so the court staff and others could go home without uh, being confronted by it. And, and that area is, is the parking lot. Is that what you're referring to? That's where, that's where the, it took place, yes. And is it your, your, was it your opinion that the court personnel had the right to utilize the parking, parking lot without coming into any contact with my client? Not any contact. They had, I believe they had a right to go to their cars without being confronted by them and things being said to them. Okay. So my client did not have the right to say things to members of the court staff in the court parking lot? He did have a right to say things to them. He was interfering with and putting them uh, in fear of what was what could happen. How was he putting them in fear? He was in the, he's been in their face, uh, up close to them, close proximity to them when they were getting into the cars. And how do you how <coughs> find close proximity? Uh, close, like right up close body. Six inches? Oh, I didn't look at, but that could be a could be that or less. So you objected to the fact that he was within, allegedly within six inches of court personnel? I objected to the, that being part of the conduct could, that was happening. Okay. It, it was ever, was he ever requested to stand further away from court personnel? I don't know whether they did or not. I don't know that. 
Now, you said that, that videos were taken. Yes. Do you have, do you still have possession of those videos? I don't have possession. Who has possession of those videos? We probably don't. I'm not sure. Because uh, they, they rewrite themselves after uh, like four or five days. Because there's 40 some odd cameras that feed that recorder. So. And these are videos of the, of the, of the Superior Court of the parking lot? Yes. And did the alleged offending conduct engaged in by Mr. Friedman, would you say captured by this video? Yes. And yet you did not preserve the Redwood video, but had it erased? It erases itself. So you did not have the authority to have it preserved? I do. Why did you not have it preserved? Um, I don't remember what the uh, what the reason why why that was not. It may have been. I the uh, I did not order that to happen, but the other people that were involved in this who served the papers may have done that. All right. And, and, and it, it did, may have done what? May have may have preserve the tapes. So you don't know whether it's been erased or not? That's correct. Now, in addition to your claim that Mr. Freeman stood too close to court personnel in the parking lot, what else did he do that you believe was improper? Uh, he had a camera in their face. Uh, is, well, was it illegal for Mr. Freeman to videotape court personnel in the court, Superior Court parking lot? No. So that was something he had a constitutional right to do? He was, he could videotape there, yes. Okay. So, I'm not asking you what he was constitutionally entitled to do. I'm asking you what did he do that he was not constitutionally entitled to in that parking lot? He came, and the other people would be the ones that, the witnesses that, that had to confront him when he came out of there. It would be better uh, suited to tell that. But he was in, the, in, in their space with their cameras, and I think that People that have a have a right to whether or not somebody's taking a picture of them is how close and what their purpose is for the picture. Whether they're up close or interfering with them uh, in taking pictures, and I don't know what was said, but they could t better testify to that. Well, I mean. Sally, did you interview court personnel before issuing this um, this order? I did not. Did not. I did not. Did you take statements from any members? I didn't. Members? I didn't do the investigation. Who did the investigation? Uh, he one of the other you know, deputies. Do you know who? Uh, you know, there were several of them involved. Was a written report issued? Uh, Are we talking about before the, before the yes. defendants were charged? Yes. We're talking about before the defendants were charged. <coughs> uh, no, I'm not aware. Sure. But there may have been. But if it was written, prepared, you never read. That's correct. Now. You said that Mr. Friedman had a right to videotape court personnel in the parking lot, but he couldn't get the camera too close. Am I correctly understanding your your testimony? He could not get in the camera and get in their face with the camera so close as to to bother them or get in their way when they're doing uh, getting into their cars. And would it have been permissible for him to film them from ten feet away? I suppose so. What else did Mr. Freeman do that you believe justifies the issuing of this order banning him from courthouse and courthouse property? It was a continuing... What else did he do? I'm going to answer that. That's the question. I'm telling you what it is. It's a continuing conduct, coming back and doing it again and then coming back again, the same people coming back again, when, at the time when the Superior Court staff were leaving the office and, and attempting to go home. Sir, let me apologize to you if my question was not clear. I was not asking about what other people did. I'm asking specifically about Mr. Friedman. And I'm not asking you how many times he did it. I'm trying to understand what he did that, in your view, justified this order banning him from the courthouse and courthouse property. What did he do? Uh, I'm answering that. It's been answered. It's been asked and answered. But if, if the record is that the only thing my client did that allegedly was improper was stand in too close physical proximity to court personnel in the parking lot, if that's the only thing he allegedly did wrong, then I'm not going to ask if there was anything else. I just want to make sure that the record is clear that there's not something else that the sheriff would like to testify to that I'm not given an opportunity to respond to. The court understands your testimony so far that, that, that 
according to what you're saying, that in your opinion, the defendants were engaged in a continuous course of doing the same thing. Correct. And what, the, what I think counsel is asking is, were there additional things that you haven't testified to already? For example, I'm making this up. Did, 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 somebody, did, did somebody actually physically assault somebody? Did somebody throw something? Was, was there something additional to, to, the, to the, the, the proximity question and the uh, camera issue? The other, the other thing being, as I, as I said... Is that the, what the question is? Yes. The, the, the issue is, is that it was repeated day after day. Same, same activity bothering the right. people's day after day. And he was asking, is, is the activity you described with any other... Right, I understand. The other kinds of activity in addition to that. that. I didn't understand his question to be that. The question was, was there anything else? And, and part of being that was the repeated day after day activity when the people were trying to leave the court. So, Sheriff, is it your position that that conduct engaged in by Mr. Freeman would have been permissible if it was done on a one time basis, but not permissible if it's being done every day? It's uh, well, doing it every day. Uh, if you. Yes, if he had done it and everything had been over, then then uh, he didn't do it again. We wouldn't have done, we wouldn't have gone further than what we did. It was his repeated coming back to the court and creating the same conduct, <coughs> the same atmosphere for the court staff that that precipitated uh, the support. Well, was Mr. Freeman, to your knowledge, ever told to stand further away from any court personnel in the parking lot? I don't know. I may have told him that they did. Did you say I don't know or no? I don't, I don't know whether he uh, said it, whether anybody told him. One of the deputies may have, but I did not. Sir, did Mr. Freeman ever do anything inside the courthouse, <coughs> which was just, which was improper and justified the standing order? On this particular instance, Any other instance? times. Oh, absolutely. Well, well, in terms of banning, you issued a banning order. The, right. It was a banning order based on anything he did in the courthouse. Uh, the banning order was given because of a course of conduct over a period of time that Mr. Freeman and Mr. Bernard had, had uh, conducted what he'd done in the courthouse over a period of time and where, where he certainly has been arrested in there. And that's over a period of time and this was a continuation of that conduct um, that, which made court staff what did Mr. Freeman do in the courthouse that justifies this order, that in your view justifies this order banning him from the courthouse? It's a, a conduct where it's coming into the front gate and it's just a, right off the top of my head, it's just a course of conduct that, um, that he and others have, have conducted, how they've conducted themselves in the court uh, in violation of the judge's orders or doing things with a bailiff. So that was. Uh, the conduct uh, coming up to the final thing where he was harassing, uh, my opinion, harassing the staff outside of the court. But forget about what other people did. He's talking now about Mr. Freeman. And I'll ask you uh, in a minute about my other client. But starting this with Mr. Freeman, what else did Mr. What did Mr. Freeman do in the courthouse that justified, in your mind, banning him from the courthouse. And I'm not talking about course of conduct, I'm talking about specific acts or specific well, that's, things. I don't remember exactly what, you know, over, it's been a period of three years that uh, uh, we've been dealing with, with Mr. Bernard in the court and there's always been something that was going on either with the bailiffs or the staff or whatever. So it's a, a period of time uh, of three years that, we, that, that I'm aware of it, that we've been dealing with him and this the last thing being um, what happened at, at the court that day, first day. So you say it's been over a course of three years and you're not able to recall a single improper act or a single improper statement? The, well, the acts, you know, right at the top of my head, I cannot uh, remember what um, everything that happened with him other than we know that that's, you know, there's been an issue in the past. Sir, do you agree as uh, you're the chief law enforcement officer for this county, is that correct? That's correct. Do you agree that Mr. Friedman had a constitutionally protected right to monitor court proceedings in Superior Courthouse? Um, Judge uh, uh, I believe the question was, uh, do you believe he had a constitutional right? Did he, does he agree that Mr. Friedman 
has a constitutionally protected right to monitor judicial proceedings in the Superior Court. I'm going to object, uh, Your Honor. The sheriff is not an attorney and is not, uh, in, uh, is not a witness who is uh, uh, best able to answer a question involving constitutional law. Your Honor, if I could respond to that, I think it's normally true that you wouldn't ask a, a non-lawyer questions of law, but in this particular case, where we're dealing with a gentleman who's identified himself as the chief law enforcement officer for Cheshire County, and his duties, I assume, would include the protection of constitutional rights, uh, it seems to me it is a reasonable question to ask him whether he understands... I think it's a reasonable question to ask, however, you, you know, I'm going to take it... It's, it's, Ultimately, up to me to make that decision. That's well, well, that's right. I simply, I simply I'm trying to understand, I'm, and I'm not trying to pursue it. I'm asking that question whether he understands or agrees, with whether he agrees that Mr. Freeman <coughs> has a constitutionally protected right, any New Hampshire citizen has a constitutionally protected right to monitor judicial proceedings in Superior Courthouse. Your Honor, before he answers, the state would like, and this is just. Uh, almost a minor point, but the state would argue that actually the sheriff is uh, probably not the chief law enforcement officer of the county. That would probably be the county attorney, just as an attorney general in the state is viewed as the chief law enforcement well, officer in the state. We know that the sheriff has, an, has is higher up than, than most people in the county law enforcement. That is correct. He's not number one, he's number two. That is correct, but um, uh, again, the state would argue that his uh, familiarity with constitutional law. And I'm gonna, I, I think the question's appropriate, but I'm going to, I'm, I'm just going to, the weight I accord it is going to be, you know, based on to the extent to which he thinks he can competently answer the questions. Ultimately, that's what we hear for me to, to decide when I hear all the evidence. Very that's good. Thank you, Your Honor. After that, Stan, if you still will call the question, you won't repeat it. Repeat the question. Sir, do you agree that Mr. Freeman and indeed all other citizens of the state have a constitutionally protected right to monitor judicial proceedings taking place in the Cheshire County Superior Court. As governed by the judge, yes. Well, does the judge have the right to raise the Constitution? The judge has, if, if I'm, I'm in charge of the security of the courthouse, and the judge has specific orders, and whatever those orders come down for any particular day or court case, um, those are the orders that, that are followed um, by my bailiffs and my deputies. And uh, there are procedures that, that the court requires, and we assist in making sure that those procedures are just like they are here. Um, so that's it's, it's. But it's your understanding that Mr. You're aware that Mr. Freeman had a practice of monitoring judicial proceedings. I assume when you're talking about Mr. Freeman, you're talking about your client. I am. Okay. Uh, thank you. Just back to this, has your client officially changed his name yet, or is it still? Your Honor, it's my position based on the New Hampshire Supreme Court that your name is a name you choose to use. Unless and it's, and it's yeah. not necessary to... <coughs> well, my understanding from, from, the, from the original arraignment is that Mr. Freeman said that he was there to, to pursue probate court for a name change. I didn't know if that was... That's well, well that, I, I, I think that's correct, Your Honor. At least it's my understanding. You don't need to go to probate court to change your name. You think that the common law of the state... Well, I was, maybe I'm just anticipating a factor in this case, but I know there's the, the setting for their presence on the occasion here, which I learned from the arraignment, was that he was there to... to to pursue that, that issue. That's well, but the, point, the point is that we have, we, the, the, point, the, the point here, Mr. Martin, is that we have his name on, appears <coughs> one way in right. one pleading, one way in another pleading, right. and we, have, we, need, we need to have some kind of consistency. That's true the other defendant, too. But beyond, just to make our positions clear, it's true that Mr. Freeman was pursuing, as I understand it, a probate court proceeding to change his name, even though my opinion is entirely unnecessary. But I'm not arguing that's the basis for him being in court. Because it's our, it's our position that his role in monitoring judicial proceedings. I'm just looking for consistency in the record and in, in all the records right. here. <coughs> and the record is not consistent. Okay. That's all. In any event, yes, sir. When I use Mr. Freeman, I'm also referring to Mr. Bernard. 
And the question was, are you aware that he has engaged in monitoring judicial proceedings over the past three years? Yes. And that that is a constitutionally protected course of conduct? Yes. But that's also governed by the spirit of the judge. But is there anything that he's engaged in while engaging in that conduct? Is there anything he's done that's violated the constitutional protection that he's entitled to doing that? Well, we've had instances where he's left his camera on in the courtroom, in the courthouse when he wasn't supposed to. We've had to tell him to take it off, even though he knows full well coming in there what the judge's orders were not to do that. So, yes, he has violated the orders as prescribed by the judge. But he's doing something that's constitutionally protected. Against the orders of the judge. Well, the monitoring itself is constitutionally protected. Your Honor, again, I'm going to stop it here. I'm not going to go too far with it. The issue is going to be up to me. I mean, the time, place, and manner of an exercise of a right. I mean, it's not an infinite right. I think we'd agree on that. The question is what we're going to take these facts in this case and decide what to apply the law and the Constitution and see where we come out. Thank you, Your Honor. Sir, prior to issuing the banning order to Mr. Friedman, did you give him any opportunity to present his point of view? Not specifically, no. Did you have any type of conversation with Mr. Friedman prior to issuing the order, about the order? No, not when I issued the order. Sir, you have in front of you a copy of the order itself, correct? Yes, I do. Yes, it is. Now, the second paragraph says, if you have any legitimate county business that requires you to enter or remain in the Cheshire County Superior Court building, you are to contact me to make an appointment to conduct your county business. What does legitimate county business mean? Whatever reason he has to be there. So anything he wants to do in the court is legitimate county business. So if he wants to go into the courtroom and go to the court and watch judicial proceedings, that's legitimate county business. Everything that he has to do in the courthouse is legitimate business. So now, am I correct that this order says you are prohibited from entering or remaining on the county property? Without getting permission to do that. For any purpose. All right. So and who is who is who has to give who's the person required to give permission? Any one of my staff can do that. They've done that. Was that what this order says? The order is for Mr. Bernard and others. And the internal order is that that any one of my staff, because most of the phone calls that come into the to the sheriff's office are for the sheriff. And they pertain to other purposes that the deputies do. If somebody calls asking for me, the staff probably has your staff looking for what the purpose of the call is. And nine times out of ten, probably 99 times out of 100, somebody else will take care of the issue as they do with these. Sir, you said they're internal orders. Are those internal orders in writing? No. Where are those internal orders? I've given them to the to the I've given them to the deputies. So you have told them that any deputy can essentially respond to a request for permission to enter the county courthouse. That's correct. So what criteria are deputies supposed to utilize in order to decide whether or not to permit entry into the courthouse? The illegitimate purpose. And that's for anything. So if any legitimate purpose is anything. Is that right? Anything legitimate purpose. That's correct. So essentially, if Mr. Freeman were to 
call your office. We wouldn't need to speak to you. We could speak to essentially any deputy in the office and any reason he gave for going to the courthouse would be considered a proper reason. Yes. And so the deputy at that point would be authorized to tell Mr. Friedman, okay, you can enter the building. Yes. Or go into the parking lot. Yes. Uh, and are, are any of these instructions or criteria in writing? As I've said, no, they're not. And have you, how would you communicate these instructions to the other? How many other deputies are there? There are nine deputies and then there's me. And how do you communicate? I've told them. Individually or in a meeting? Uh, could have, if they weren't all at a meeting, it could have been both. So if Mr. Freeman had called your office and said, I want to go to the courthouse parking lot for the purpose of videotaping court personnel, your sheriffs, your deputies would have been instructed to say damn fine. Is that right? Yes. So there's nothing that Mr. Freeman did prior to issuing this order that he couldn't do after issuing this order. That's correct. So basically this order isn't worth the piece of paper it's written on. That's not correct. All right. Well, what is the purpose of this order if it simply requires my client and other people receiving this order to call your office where they can talk to anybody and get automatic approval? What does it accomplish? It accomplishes that we know that he's going to be there and it, it eases the deputy uh, bailiffs and, and the court staff. So we know he's going to be in the courthouse because of his prior history in the parking lot in the courthouse. We know he's going to be there. And that's basically that's what it's for is that if he's going to come into the courthouse or any one of the other individuals coming into the courthouse, the purpose is for us to know they're in the courthouse. That's basically the purpose of the order. Now, you could have drafted an order to Mr. Freeman saying, please call us before you go to the courthouse, correct? That's basically what that says. That's basically what it says. And it also, but this also says you are prohibited from entering or remaining on the county property of 12 Winter Street in King. Yes. Did you mean that? Along with the last paragraph, yes. Did you mean to prohibit him from entering or remaining on the county property at 12 Winter Street in King? Without permission, without us knowing it. You're saying permission's automatic. <coughs> is that permission? The permission is, is because you know, permission is an internal thing, and you're taking one part of the order that that's totally changed by the last paragraph. It says because he can he, he can come in. Well, this this is this is titled no trespassing order. That's what it is. What sort of no trespassing order is it when you're intending to give free access to the person receiving the order? Your Honor, I would uh, say would object to being argumentative. I I would drop that question. Okay. I think that's correct. Um, so, from your perspective, the only purpose of this no trespass order is to give court personnel peace of mind that they would know in advance when Mr. Bernard or anybody else um, subject to this order is um, going to be in a courthouse? That's basically what it is. Now, to understand the, the Superior Court process a little better, am I correct in understanding you can't just walk in the door anyway? You have to uh, present yourself to one of your deputies yeah. Yeah. Um, and go through a search process, etc., etc. et cetera. And at that point, presumably your bailiff or your deputies could notify all their personnel that Mr. Freeman or anybody else is present, correct? 
if they're able to do that. Why can't they be able to do that? Because there are other people there, and somebody has to take the time to get on the phone to do that. And we've also had instances where we've had people that, I don't remember whether uh, Mr. Bernard or not, but others, it may have been somebody, one of those five, that we've had to go through and breach the security, where they've had to be wrestled down in front of the security there. Well, so, wait, 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 I'm not talking about Mr. Mr. Freeman. Well, you no, know, the question was whether or not bailiff would be able to uh, notify other people in the court. And I'm saying that that's not necessarily possible because of the other <coughs> being there in the, secure, the screening process. If we were know they're going to come in, we could have two people there. Well, but, but so with one person there, they can't necessarily stop and make a phone call to let everybody know that any individual is going to be in, in the courthouse. So it's not, it's, they're busy, it's not an instantaneous thing that can happen. Doesn't, um, what type of communication system do the bailiffs have with other court personnel? They have a tele, to other court personnel, they have a tele. I mean, they could have the cell phone or they go to the They have a phone, a regular phone. There's two phones actually right there by the bail station. They'll walk and talk to you. Like Amongst their own people, they can do with that other notify the courts. Wow, well, but I mean, surely it must, surely the bail, the, the bailiffs surely have means of communicating to other court personnel by using the telephone. Isn't that correct? The other court, the only people that they have access to talk to are the other bailiffs with, by, by radio and to my people downstairs uh, in the sheriff's office. So they can certainly, when Mr. Friedman arrives, if they thought it necessary, they can certainly radio to your people and tell them Mr. Friedman has arrived, correct? Um, that's not, they could do that if there's somebody there, yes. We're busy also. Well, but you might be less busy if your office didn't have to answer phone calls every time Mr. Freeman or somebody else wanted to end All right, objection, Your Honor. <laughs> Sustained. Thank you, Your Honor. <clears throat> Sir, you've got a copy of your order in front of you. Thank you. Wouldn't a reasonable person receiving this order interpret it to mean that they could enter the courthouse and set their own court appearances? Isn't how that would be reasonably interpreted? Isn't it grafted for that purpose? No, it's not. You say, wouldn't a reasonable person, person think had that interpreted this to mean that they couldn't enter the courthouse except for their own court appearances? And the answer is no. No, that's, that's I, just, I didn't get the I didn't get the end of this question. The answer is that reading the order, they can enter the courthouse if they call. <coughs> they can enter the courthouse if they call. If they call. And is there any reason you didn't put into this letter, in Mr. Friedman's statement, you can enter the courthouse after you call? You just said that that's what it says. It's a call for permission. Is that what it says? You have this part of you. Make an appointment to conduct your county business. So. Now, so you said you got this trespass order from something that was used by other um, county employees for the purpose of um, other county buildings? Yes. And who did you get it from? I'm not sure where it came. It might have been uh, sent to me by email from someone. I don't remember where it came from. And, um, was it your understanding that the purpose of this order is simply that it doesn't really mean no trespass, it simply means call first? For the purpose of the order, for us, the, the, the reason that, because that's what the order is, is no trespass order. And, but it, and it's the same, it was used for a lot of the county buildings, such as the nursing home at 33 West Street, so that people were coming and creating a disturbance would be told to leave, and that they had to come back to visit a loved one in the nursing home or whatever, they could call so people at the nursing home would know that they were coming. Okay. How long was this order intended to last? Uh, there wasn't a, a time, it was based on the conduct of the people who were involved. If uh, conduct was proper and, and they followed the, the rule, it, it was no, um, it's just so that they un understood it was a, it's a 
a temporary basis to be done with based on their conduct and how they treated themselves in accordance with the law. When you say temporary basis, is there anything in this order indicating this temporary? No. Isn't it fair to say that you communicated to the individuals covered by this order that the order was intended forever? I don't know I said that. Did you say that? I don't believe I said that. Was it your intent that this order go on forever? No. How long was the order intended? The order was, as I just stated, it was depending on uh, their conduct and how, how when they came into the court, how, how <coughs> the conduct was and how things went. If everything was, uh, conduct was proper and we had no problems, then there's no reason why the court couldn't be received. Now, in, in, this, in Mr. Bernard's case, Mr. Friedman's case, you're aware that he argued in his defense on this case that he called your office on the day he came in and did not get left a message. I don't know that. You're not aware of that. Do you know whether he called your office on that day? I don't know. I don't remember the date of this happened. But if he'd called and told somebody what he wanted, he would have been given permission to come in. So anybody, not even, not even a deputy, even, even a receptionist? No, I, it was clear in my previous testimony that the deputies are the ones that make that decision. Now, sir, you're familiar with a woman by uh, the name of Lynn Sarevsky? Yes. Yes. And I want to ask you, because I'm also representing her in this proceeding, what acts, if any, did she commit that you allege justified disorder? Uh, she was part of the uh, five that were creating the disturbance. No, no, what did she do? As being one of the members that were doing the, uh, the same thing. Well, what is it she did? We're talking here now about a criminal prosecution, not about group liability. What did she do? Um, she came as part of the group, and that's what is part of the... There can be a group liability, she being a member, and conducting herself in the same manner. She may not have had a camera, but she was there <coughs> with the group, conducting themselves in that manner that caused the, uh, the disturbance or the problem with the support staff. So she was part of a group, and that's the sole basis no, of the disorder? It was a, no, the sole basis, as I just said, was the conduct of those people. She was one of them in going with them. Well, what and was the conduct was interfering with or coming and interacting, what I saw, harassing, my opinion, harassing the court staff as they were leaving. Okay, well, what did she do that was harassing? She was one of the others, the same, getting close by, and, and uh, she didn't have a camera to stick in someone's face, but um, she was part of that group. Did, kept, you kept, did you specifically see her get close by? Um, I, she was there with them, so yes. So I said yes or no? Yes. She was part of... So she got too close... I don't, I don't know that she got within six inches of anybody, but she was part of the group that was creating the uh, disturbance where she was, they were yelling at the staff and, and creating the R of fear amongst the people on the staff. How close did she get to the staff? I don't remember. I'm, I'm looking at a camera, so... It was a course of conduct that caused that problem. So she was part of that course of conduct. Right. So whether she got, she individually got too close to any staff member or not, you don't know. I can't, no. no. But your overall reason for this no trespass order was because in your view, this group of, of approximately five individuals got too close to court personnel in the Superior Courthouse parking lot, and some of these individuals had video cameras. It's uh, that's not a simplification. It's a course of conduct where they're yelling and and the uh, recording the people, their license plate numbers, them the whole course of conduct that put them in fear of 
uh, confrontation with five people in, in the normal course of their business as they were attempting to go home. Right, but, but take any one of those incidents, they, they allegedly getting too close, using a video camera, the, the filming of license plates, how are any of those affected by this no trespass order? Well, they can go. The, the issue is that they they want to stay. They actually came, came back at the next day, and that's how they get issued the order. They came back and stood on the sidewalk and, and to do the same thing. We just gave them the order. There was nothing wrong with them, and they knew they could do that. That was the issue. The issue was being in close proximity to the staff so that they felt that they were threatened or uh, being harassed by them. Right. But how is that problem addressed by issuing them the generic no trespass order, which is basically simply saying call first. How would it be any different if they called your office before they went to the parking lot? I mean, your your people order? are right there anyway. It's not like you have to travel 20 miles to the scene of the event. How does this no trespass order accomplish any of the, or address any of the concerns that you've outlined? No trespass order lets us know they're coming, and we can be there as necessary so the court staff can move freely to their car and without being um, threatened by the, by the group. Oh. And the court staff will know that they're there. Okay. What, the last day when, this, when they were finally driven off the property, they were waiting in a parking lot and waited for the staff to come out, and then they came over after. Right. But where is, the, where is the sheriff's office located? Downstairs. In the Spirit Courthouse? Yes. How far from the parking lot? It's in the, in the adjacent to the parking lot. So you don't need an advance phone call or coming to the parking lot in order to provide, if you feel you need to provide more security in the parking lot, you can certainly do without this type of work. No, because there may not be anybody there. Um, it's very, very feasible that there are, if there's no prisoners in, and this is happening after work, if there are no prisoners downstairs when there's liable that the deputies have a lot of other things to do, if they don't need to be in that office, they're not in the office. Well, but they're in the building. No. You, you have nine deputies. That's correct. And yourself. <coughs> if there is a need for people to you, you, you can, if you felt there was a need for people in the parking lot, you can put people in the parking lot, correct? Yes. And if an illegal act is engaged in the parking lot, you can arrest somebody in the parking lot, correct? Yes. Have, have any of these individuals ever been arrested for doing anything illegal in the parking lot? Uh, I don't think either one of these two have. If um, 
other individuals had come to the court parking lot and engaged in the same activity, i.e. expressing themselves or using videotape or personnel. Would you still issue the banning order? Was the banning order based upon the fact that these individuals were members of the group at the same time? The term, the term group is identifying five people as being those five people. That's what it is. They were there, those were the five people. That's the group. That five. It's got nothing to do. If anybody else came, five or six people came, another group came in, whatever their purpose would be, and created the same disturbance and ended up with the same order, I would refer to them as a group. But some of the individuals, these five individuals who were there, some of them had never been to the parking lot before, correct? I have no idea. So you've seen Mr. Freeman there before, correct? Yes. But there are other individuals who issued a banning order who had never been to the parking lot before in their lives. I have no idea. See, anyway, you didn't necessarily know that all of the, it wasn't a condition of receiving this banning order that the individuals had been to the parking lot before. Other than the previous days, yes. They were repeat from when the incident started. They were there until the final order was given. So they had been there before that day when the order was given, the verbal order. Why didn't you just give them an order saying, keep out of the parking lot? I did. No, but you could have given them a written order saying, keep out of the parking lot. You didn't have to say, a written order saying, stay out of the courthouse. Could have done either. The courthouse is just the, you know, it's the whole thing. It's just, it's a history that we've had in there and that was just included in it. So we know that they're coming into the courthouse. And what are you going to do differently if you know they're coming into the courthouse? If they say they're coming in, then we're just aware of it. And depending on, and if necessary, we notify the bailiffs they're coming in and know where they are in the courthouse, that's all. Well, first of all, it might be possible that your answer is you're not going to do anything differently if you know they're coming into the courthouse. Other than the notifications and depending, you know, if they're there for a court case or whether there are other people coming, depending on what's going on that day, we're going to adjust to cover whatever we need to do. So it's an evaluation we make on a day-to-day basis as to what's going on. So if they're coming, we know they're coming, then we just adjust there. Well, you've got a certain, you've got a certain amount of staff to cover the court building no matter what, correct? Yes, we have bailiffs. And we're going over the same ground again. Is there a new point? No, I don't want to talk about this. So, sir, is it fair to say that the order that you gave to my clients is not intended as an order for them not to enter the courthouse, but is intended just as an order for them to notify your office before they enter the courthouse? Is that a fair summary of your position? Of my position, that's correct. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. And thank you, your honor. First, Sheriff Hood, you just indicated that by having this no trespass order and the requirement that you be notified, you meaning the sheriff's department, be notified. Actually, I'm just going to stand off to the side and get stretched a little bit. Go ahead. Be notified. You indicated that that would allow you to adjust your personnel assignments. Is that correct? Yes. And under ordinary circumstances, how many deputies might you have at the courthouse at any particular time? Is there any 
I mean, are... <coughs> Uh, it depends on what I need. They come and go as they as they need to for their normal business, and if, if I need somebody to be there, then they adjust their business to take care of the needs we have uh, at the courthouse. I've actually called uh, deputies from other counties to come in to help uh, when I had to, when I needed to do that. Are there many instances? Uh, are there many instances where there might not be any sheriff's deputies at the courthouse and only bailiffs? Yes. And would it be fair to say that by requiring the notice, that would allow you to assure that there were at least some deputies there to assist the bailiffs should it be needed? Yeah, these are, are leading questions, even though it's a cross-examination, essentially, the state's witness. It is, it is cross, Your Honor, and uh, the... Upper rule, go ahead. Thank you. Could you repeat the question? Uh, w would it be fair to say that by requiring notice, uh, it allowed you uh, to... Uh, arrange your staffing in such a way that there would uh, definitely be uh, some deputies available should the bailiffs need assistance. Yes, can adjust our staff. Um, as sheriff, are you responsible for court safety? And security, yes. For court safety and security. And uh, were there any actions committed by uh, both defendants, uh, Mr. Bernard and Ms. Saraski, uh, that, in your opinion, affected court safety and security? No, I would simply request that the, rather than lumping the two, I don't mind the question lumping the two together, but I would request that the answer for clarification of the record, clarity of the record, that the two individuals not be treated as one entity, but that the the state will rephrase the question, Your Honor. Uh, <coughs> as the person responsible for court safety and security, were any actions committed by the defendant, Ian Bernard, that, in your opinion, affected court safety and security and that uh, uh, led to your uh, serving the no trespass order? Yes. And what were those acts? Uh, particularly confronting the judge when he left his chambers to go to his car with a group of, I don't know whether all five of them came specifically to him, but coming to him with a cam with a camera and, and surrounding him uh, as he was trying to get in his car. Uh, do you know whether uh, judges' license plates were videotaped by uh, 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 by the uh, defendant, by uh, uh, Mr. Bernard. I don't, I don't know. And uh, did you receive any requests uh, from uh, the judges uh, for uh, coverage when they left the building? Uh, yes. And uh, uh, what uh, what actions were they uh, concerned with? The actions we well, wait, 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 wait. I, I think that the state of mind of the people who asked him is really beyond his witness's testimony. I don't have any problem with him testifying as to what actions he requested to take, but not about what their concerns were. Okay. Um, the so you, uh, you have any response to the objection? Yeah, well, the, the state believes, Your Honor, that uh, as the, uh, the, the, defend, the defense is... Well, the, question, the question you asked was what were the judge's concerns, and the objection was the, because the, the state of mind of the judges is not important. And the state would say that that doesn't... Well, it should say not, not important. I think it was not... Is it not relevant? Right, right. It's not, it's not that it's not important. Well, it, 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 well it's not that it's... The ground is not so much importance and relevance as, as, as hearsay and lack of foundation. 
that, that the, these, the judges presumably could come in if they wanted to and testify to their concerns, but this witness is not in a position to give, I mean. Yeah, on the hearsay, that's, I thought it was hearsay, so. Yeah, hearsay. It's, uh, uh, the state will rephrase the question. Uh, did you observe any actions directed towards the judges that uh, impacted your uh, concerns regarding court safety and security? Um, when the judge left uh, the side uh, building, the side door of the courthouse, and to go to his car. The, judge that was on duty that day to go to his car, the fact that he was going to his car and there were people that were coming toward him um, to his car uh, certainly created a concern on my part that what their purpose was um, and sent deputies out for that and then it occurred again the next day uh, the same way. We sent somebody out with the judge and went out so that to keep them, keep them back from so he be safe. Involved? No. 
and did the same, uh, did that also apply to the defendant, uh, Lynn Sarasky? Yes. Is it your, uh, as, as sheriff, uh, strike that, earlier in your uh, testimony, uh, in response uh, to a question, you indicated that you may not have been, you weren't sure as to whether there may have been a report issued on uh, the uh, incident that uh, I understood correctly that led to the instant charge of uh, criminal trespass, um, and uh, you indicated you were not sure. Is it, as sheriff, uh, is it part of your normal course of events to read personally every report uh, drafted by one of your deputies? No. What is the procedure within the sheriff's department regarding um, uh, approval of reports? We have a lieutenant that, that uh, reads and approves the reports and, and uh, make sure that they're done correctly. If I need to, I can go on computer and pull it, pull it up and, and read it. But in the normal course of business, I do not. Okay. And uh, if you were, uh, as sheriff, do you have a lot of administrative responsibilities? Yes. And uh, if you were required to read every report written by your deputies, would you be able to complete all your administrative responsibilities as well? Probably within a course of time. In a timely manner? Well, I don't know. It's, it's just not something that I, that I do. It's my call, and I don't have any need to uh, repeat, uh, review all the reports that go to the sheriff's office. toward him, uh, and that's that's a concern for me because that's a concern for the safety of the judge because I don't know what their intentions are, and if they wanted to take, they could take film from the, either one of the sidewalks, it was actually one of them they could see the judge's car from. So that's, they're far enough away and there's a, a lack of threat of five people or coming, whatever people coming to the judge as he's trying to get into his car. That That is a, that's a security issue as far as I'm concerned. But were there any, were there any, um, my question was, was, was whether there was a security issue. My question was, how would your, if your banning order had been in effect at the time, or your trespass order, how would that have made you, how would it make you They wouldn't have been able to come to the, if they'd got permission to be there, then we would have known with that they, they were there and taken whatever action we needed before the judge came out, which I eventually did anyway. The second time around, and the third. Taking take any action, meaning? Pro protecting the judge from people that are coming up, up 
you know, approaching him as he's trying to get in his car. So, but were there any sheriff's personnel present during this situation? Um, they came up, yes. They were there anyway, right? But they weren't there with the judge. You know, it takes a very little time to hurt somebody. Nobody's ever been hurt. Or no, um, that's, hurt, I'm right? looking at it from my perspective. It takes a very little time for somebody to be hurt if there's nobody there to protect them. Now, the, you also complain in your cross-examination about videotaping staff license plates. How would your no trespass order have any effect on that? Um, other than they're right there taking and seeing which person gets into what car and seeing what's in the car. There's just a lot of other the security issues with that, but they can be up there and, and with the person that's working in the court getting into that car. Right. But if, in fact, permission to be on court is as automatic as you claim it is, then it wouldn't matter that you go and videotape the license plates whether or not an order was in effect, correct? It's not automatic, and the point is that that it's automatic, but we would know that the purpose of the order is so that we know that they're there, and then the staff leaves if they're they're giving their purpose for being in, there in the parking lot of the court, then my staff can be there to make sure that the court staff can uh, get to their car without any problem. Right, but the issue is not the court staff getting to the car, the issue is your concern with the video taking a license. That's which is concerned with the security of the court. Right. But that's not something that in any way is affected by your no trespass order, correct? Yeah, they, they can't, without the, the order prevents them from coming in without our knowledge to be there. And we can, if we know they're going to be there, we can interfere with them in the court staff. Interfere with them? Meaning keep them from, from interacting with the court staff. So you prevent them from videotaping a license plate? Probably not. So they would have done anyway, correct? But it's the, the 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 element of fear that comes from the people that are there, close proximity to uh, to the staff. So they could have done it from the sidewalk. But the issue is is that we you know we didn't know that they're on the property that we know about it, and we can better protect uh, the court staff. Now, sir, getting just in terms of the, the, the notice part that you talked about, you said that your deputies understood that anybody uh, who received permission. Uh, anybody who asked who was subject to the expense trespass order automatically received permission, regardless of the reason they wanted to enter court property. Now, would that, how would that permission be documented? That they came. Excuse me? That they showed up in court. It's just a, it's a. Well, is there some written, does, there, does the person then receive some written notice that they are authorized to be in court property? No, they're told, uh, it's a, we've even done it by phone. Okay. That's how it's done frequently, most of the time by phone. We get the request by phone and somebody notifies the bailiff that so-and-so is coming in, and that's the end of it. So, so well, is the deputy sheriff then required to notify the bailiff? He does, yes, and they do. The... Well, has that ever in fact happened? Is what whatever happened? Has any has the bailiff ever been notified of somebody receiving a no trespass order in the courthouse with permission? If they've been given permission to come in, then the bailiff's been notified. But is this I have not done it. Has anybody ever done it? Has it ever happened? Uh, you'd have to ask the people that, that gave the order. That's the procedure, and I'm sure that the procedure's been followed. Well, you don't know if the situation has ever arisen, do you? That the, no, no, that's, I know that the procedure is followed. If there's an instant that, that it wasn't, then. Well, the, Mr. Freeman, um, hypothetically, calls your office, gets your approval to go to the courthouse, enters the courthouse. You're saying that you notify the bailiff. But how, does, how do other people, how do other court security staff, other, other deputy sheriffs, sheriffs know he's there with permission? Uh, because the bailiff let him in. And frequently when they, they, uh, they just, they, they're no, and if he was in the building. Your, Your Honor, uh, the, these questions are going beyond the scope of uh, new information that was uh, brought up uh, on cross. And the uh, 
state uh, believes that uh, uh, these uh, these questions are uh, have actually been touched on previously in uh, the defendant's uh, direct examination. Your Honor, I don't have any need to ask any further questions on the subject matter. Okay. Anything else? Um, Nothing further. I just have sure. just a couple questions, Sheriff. Um, I, I'm just assuming so when safety and security are intermingled concepts, you don't make different decisions for safety, different decisions for security. They just sort of, it's yeah. just a phrase. Yeah. Yes. Um, is, and, and are you saying that it, it's not possible that, for example, if I, if I were one of the five per persons notified in, in the order, um, and I called up and got one of, one of your deputies and said, I want to go to the parking lot because and because I want to take employees' license plates. I want to video them. You're saying that that would have been, that would not have been denied. Uh, that's never happened, but probably not, as long as they're not interfering with the... I guess my question is... Because that's what we're doing. I guess, what's, what's the possibility that one person of the five listed could have called and gotten one deputy who would have granted permission to enter the property for a particular reason, and another person got a different deputy and got a different answer. So, no, that's not a legitimate purpose. Is, is that a possibility? No. It would be um, you know, discussion. So, you're saying, so, you're saying, so the, just the simple act of asking, the question, of asking for permission is an across the board, the, the answer is going to be, be yes every time. Unless they came to say that they're going to come to solve the Well, problem. I understand, obviously. Uh, so, if it's for legitimate purposes? Well, so that's, I yeah. guess that's what I'm getting at. I mean, for, for, for legitimate purposes, is it possible that one deputy might, might interpret a request as legitimate and another deputy might interpret it not as legitimate? And they might be on, the same, on, the, on a different phone at the same time. No, that's legitimate purposes, whatever they're, whatever they're coming in for, other than some sort of, you know, extreme yeah. thing as I described. Based on my question, do you have anything, Mr. Mark? I have no further questions. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I guess there's still a sequestration order. Can the sheriff go back to work, or do you need to stick around? I, I, I'm fine. Right and, uh, and secondly, for the, as far as the trespass order, it was referred to, but I've got a copy in one of the pleadings. Is that sufficient for the record that the trespass order is in the record? Yes. Yeah, right? yeah. And the state has no objection to the sheriff being dismissed. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's 10 to 12. What are we looking at for uh, Your Honor, I think, uh, Your Honor, I only have um, basically two more witnesses, and I said we'll be rather brief. Okay. And the state has uh, uh, witnesses that are members of the uh, uh, Superior Court uh, clerk's uh, staff. Uh, and their testimony will also be relatively brief. So I'm willing to just keep going. I'll take a five minute recess and then. State is no okay. the State appreciates the court's willingness to follow those. Well, this could just be solved by an apology by Sheriff Foote, apparently. Like, oops, I did a, I made a mistake. Yeah. Which, you know, we all do that, right? Yeah, I'm not going to say. Just a little, oops, I overstepped. Uh, uh, you're sorry. No, I know. I'm talked to him before today. And the prosecuting attorney? Oh, God. That's embarrassing. He needs to get a speech there. All right. I'm going to go downstairs. I'm get some water. I'm standing in the hall. You can see the Yeah, I was 
So we're going to have a day of 10 that doesn't fit. They're not there. They're pulling some of the day prior. So I was, I was only there one day. Yeah, I was there the day prior and the day prior to that. I just have to not be there that day. So I didn't want to leave the camera. So there's like five minutes and they're like, you're this. Just be away to the city of the university. I was not there for a day before. Specifically, I was there for a day before. Who is my group? Like, just because I'm standing with people. We took my group out. And I went inside. The offense was later. Yeah. Well, that's basically coming out at some point while we're still there. And I called him after you know, you know, know, you know, know, yeah, the yeah, 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 you know, were part of the time. If you weren't there with the group, this would be the issue. Okay, so what did I do? You were in the group. I like the phone notification thing where you see the group. I like the phone
and uh, for uh, just to uh, for the record, uh, Your Honor, the uh, witnesses from the clerk's office are under a uh, protective order granted by this honorable court uh, that allows them to simply uh, testify using their first name and a uh, general uh, location for oh, their paper address is usually irrelevant anyway. Please raise your right hand. You swear or affirm anything you say you don't be the truth. Have a seat, please. Uh, uh, by this, as, uh, how do you spell your first name? A-U-N-A. Okay. Well, good morning. Uh, how are you employed? And as an employee of the Superior Court, uh, during a period of time in late 2012, were you exposed uh, to uh, certain activities uh, when you were uh, entering and leaving, when you were arriving for work and leaving work at the end of the day? Yes. And uh, could you, uh, uh, and were these activities uh, uh, conducted by, among other people, uh, the uh, defendant uh, Ian Bernard and uh, uh, Lynn Saraski. Yes. And uh, could you please describe to this honorable court uh, what those uh, activities were? I never really had to deal with anything that happened in the morning, um, but it was generally at night when we were leaving. Um, all of us staff members felt like we need to leave together because they were out back singing Christmas carols and waiting for us to come out with video cameras. Um, they weren't necessarily like coming at us, but they were standing along the side of us. So we felt that we all would walk out as a group so that we didn't get individualized. Were these, you say, singing Christmas carols? Yep. Were these traditional Christmas carols? Um, Traditional sound-wise, but change in words. And what were the words, uh, what, what message were the words conveying? Um, if I remember correctly, it was in regards to an incident that had to do with one of the bailiffs. And so his name was being brought into the Christmas carols. And uh, were questions being asked to you as you were leaving the building? Uh, yeah. And do you recall what some of those questions were? Do you recall whether the defendant, uh, Ian Bernard, uh, asked you any questions specifically? It wasn't directed at me, per se, but it was directed towards the group, which it was like, okay. how, how do you, do you know what I mean? uh, Of which you were a part. Yes. Right. Yes. Okay. Um, how does it make you feel to have someone like Bob working for you after his behaviors? Basically, I mean that word exact word. What that was. What tone of voice was it asking? It was in a, I would consider it like a harassing voice. And um, did anybody respond? No. And. Um, What, how long did this last? Um, basically from the back of the building where we exit to our vehicles. Okay, I, I, uh, I'm sorry. For what, time, how, for what time frame did this last? I mean, did it last, did it last days, did it last weeks? Uh, at least a couple of days that, that I remember specifically. There was a couple of mornings that I avoided um, because I don't get to work until 8, other staff gets there at 7.30, so they would call and, and say, don't park in your usual spot, park somewhere else. So there was a couple of occasions that I avoided, you know, situations with them. Uh, were there uh, any efforts um, by anybody to attempt to uh, look in windows of the of the courthouse and uh, 
if, if so, were, was any, uh, what means was used? I do remember at one point um, somebody was flying a helicopter that had a video camera on it. Um, and it was flown up into the second story floor. And uh, when you say, uh, is this a, a remote a model? It was a remote helicopter. Yeah. Okay. And I do remember watching the video online after. Okay. And uh, how did it make you feel uh, seeing, uh, you know, seeing videos put online and knowing that the videos that were being taken of you in the uh, parking lot? How did that make you feel? I didn't care for it. There's no reason for us to be put on the internet. We're doing our jobs. There's no reason for, you know, the harassment. I mean, I don't necessarily feel like they would physically do anything to us, but just the fact that they're out back with the video cameras taping us, you know, asking us questions, directing comments towards us, that's, that's harassing to me. It makes me feel uncomfortable. I don't like it. So, and especially I don't like being put on the internet, obviously. Were you concerned for your well-being? I was not concerned physically. I didn't think physically, you know, there was going to be any issues, but, you know, to what extent was it going to stop? You know, I mean, is it going to be one of those things where I go to the grocery store and I see them and I'm going to have to deal with it there, or, you know, it's just frustrating. It's frustrating and it's, it's just, it's, it's, it's scare, it scares me too because I'm not a confrontational person. So when somebody's coming out and have a video camera on us and because of something that happened in another part of the building that has nothing to do with us, you know. So you felt scared by these incident, in, incidents? I did. It's unnerving. It's unnerving. I mean, it's, I think it's uncalled for the fact that we all felt like we had to walk out as a group to not be individualized. I, I just, that's not fair, you know, we're all there to do our jobs, get a paycheck, go home and feed our families. We're not lawyers, we're not the judge, you know, we're there to do our jobs. And so for us to be brought into this is very unfair. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for coming, I have no questions. Thank you. You're still on a sequestration order, so you can't share your testimony with anybody until we're also done with the case. But, but you can go back to work, I assume. Uh, say there's no objection to it. And then you, you have a witness or two after that? Yes, sir. Stand for a moment. Please put your hand. You swear or affirm anything you say here will be the truth. Yes. What's your first name? Jessica. Go ahead. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, good morning. Could you please uh, uh, indicate uh, to the court how you're employed, where you're employed? I'm a clerk at Treasure County Square. Thank you. Um, during the latter part of 2012, uh, do you recall um, incidents uh, when you were arriving? The latter part of 2012? Uh, excuse me, uh, 2011. Excuse me, Your Honor. Uh, do you recall uh, in the latter part of uh, 2011 uh, incidents uh, uh, when you would be arriving at work and leaving work at the end of the day? Um, where uh, you had contact with uh, the defendant, uh, Ian Bernard, and uh, Lynn Sarasky. And uh, could you tell uh, this honorable court what the nature of that contact was? It was, I felt that it was harassing questions, intimidating questions, uh, being asked questions about my employer and the people that I work with. Uh, being videotaped, taking pictures of my vehicle while we were coming in and out of work. Uh, do you remember uh, specifically what any of the questions were? So 
some of them were in relation to the judge. Um, some of them were about the bailiffs, some of the bailiffs that we work with. Um, some of them were in regards to somebody who took their life out in front of the courthouse. What time did you arrive at work? I come in at 7.30. And uh, were they already there? Yes. And uh, at that hour, was there usually, were there usually other people in the parking lot? Some other employees, but no. And uh, how did you feel when these actions uh, occurred? I felt, I was, I was worried. I was afraid for my safety. I was, felt threatened. I was intimidated by them. I was, I was uncomfortable being in their presence outside of the building. And uh, did you feel the need to leave with everybody else? Yes. And why was that? Because we felt safer in numbers. We felt more comfortable having our fellow co-workers together to leave together. And uh, did they stand in any particular way, uh, in terms of when you were leaving at the end of the day? It all depended. It varied from day to day. Sometimes they'd be at the bottom of the stairs. Sometimes they'd just be over near our parked cars. If they were at the bottom of the stairs, did they ever stand in a particular um, format? Or just like a semicircle down at the bottom of the stairs. And uh, did, uh, uh, so were you, uh, by their standing in a semicircle, did they part when you tried to go through, when yes. you wanted to go through? Yep. Uh, how close were they to you when you uh, went through? Depending upon the incident, sometimes they'd be rather close, sometimes they'd be further away. And uh, how close were they when um, cabinets? were uh, directed at you and they would come over to your car? That also varied depending upon the incident. Sometimes they would be really close and sometimes they'd be across the parking lot. When you say really close, what's really close? I would say within five, six feet of us. sang um, Christmas carols? Their own versions of them, yes. And what do you mean by their own version? They would change the words to Christmas music to involve whatever incident they were outside about that day. And how did that make you feel? Uncomfortable. And why? <laughs> just because just having them out there harassing us like that is an uncomfortable situation. And um, how have things been since the uh, 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 defendants were served with the uh, no trespass order? Do you feel uh, do you feel more comfortable? <coughs> yes, I do. It's a lot. We're more comfortable. I'm more comfortable coming in and leaving work. I don't feel intimidated or threatened. There's nobody outside harassing us while we're trying to get to our jobs or leave our jobs. Um, and there actually has been a lot less issues within the building also. Say something further. My name is John Meyer and I represent him. Uh, you started off your testimony by saying you were concerned you were being asked in these your words intimidating questions. What do you mean by intimidating questions? I don't cause any intimidating. I felt intimidated. By the questions. Being asked questions and having somebody. And you, say, you say you felt what were the questions were? So regarding our work, regarding our employer, regarding the judge, regarding uh, the bailiffs, regarding working in a place that um, was against what they believed should be. Was any type of threat ever addressed to you? No.
Honor, if I may have just a moment. scenarios where you um, uh, encountered the, uh, said the spook people, sometimes in the parking lot, sometimes in the courthouse. How many times did that happen? I'll call it. I didn't Less than 10. I would say probably more than 10. Is it true that all occurred in one week in the end of 2011? Not all incidents. And is it true that some of those incidents occurred with, um, or some of those encounters occurred with the sheriff's deputies being present? There was some that they were outside the building. Yes. Thank you. Any more questions? Can you redirect? No, Your Honor. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Still uh, can't discuss the testimony here, but you're excused and we'll go back to work, I guess. Yes. Thank you. Thank Your Honor. you. probably because of the fact that the order was issued and the people have been in the area that I just heard about it through the office workers. Did the, um, were any type of procedures or protocols established to your knowledge regarding this order? I'm not sure I understand what you mean. Well, you have, you have given a copy of this order? Yes, I was. Did anybody ever explain to you how it should apply? Um, no one explained to me how it should apply. Um, Let me show you the, this document. What identify that as being Just one second. Legitimate corpus county business if they're there for, I 
just the terminology is county business. If they, for the people that I spoke to, when they called, they said that they were there to, they have a, their friend had a court, they were there for court, um, and basically just so long, if, if I knew, I just notified the bailiffs that they were coming from. But what, um, what did you notify the court officers of this the bailiffs are the people that are responsible for checking the people in. But well, I think you never fired the sheriff's deputy, it's just the bailiff. If they, no, I didn't. Did you ever, did you notify the sheriff? Uh, I, I'm going to say no, I never did notify the sheriff. Was well, any change in staffing ever made based upon somebody on this list calling and saying they wanted to go to the courthouse? I'm not sure I understand what you mean by changing yeah. staff. Well, was, was any additional staff added or subtracted or redeployed I based have, on somebody contacting you requesting permission for a the disorder? I have no idea. All I did was pass the notification on. If I thought that there would be an issue, I just asked one of the deputies to hang around the office. Hang around the office? Yep. But as opposed, I'm sorry. But we never. <coughs> Did you ever deploy additional personnel in the courtroom or redeploy them based on this? Based on this, I myself have yes. never done that. To your knowledge, has anybody else ever done that? I, um, to my knowledge, no. Now, in, in, in terms of the, um, again, this legitimate county business, How, does anybody ever explain to you what that meant? No, they have not. If somebody said they wanted to go to the courthouse just to observe, would that be legitimate kind of business? If they were there to absorb, observe a court case, um, the people that called me, that made mention of that to me, I saw no reason that they couldn't come in, and I said, just so long as they know that you're coming in, that's fine. But what if they just they didn't want to observe a particular case, they just wanted to observe the court proceedings generally? Would that be okay? That, that, that never happened to me, that never. But how do you know what was a permissible and impermissible basis for having the court? I, the only thing that I was going by is legitimate county business. They were there to observe a case. I consider that to be legitimate county business. What would be illegitimate? What would be an example of something that would not be illegitimate? That, that was never presented to me during the time that I was talking to the people that called me on the phone. But did you ever understand what would be an example of that? I never was told that a certain thing would be considered illegitimate county business. Well, what if somebody called you and said they wanted to they wanted to enter the courthouse parking lot for the purpose of being a ticket, um, license plate, cars parked in that parking lot? Would that, that be legitimate? That never occurred, so I, I, I guess I'd have to take it on a case-by-case -case basis. Well, what criteria would you apply for deciding on a case-by-case -case basis? I guess I would uh, determine based on common sense. <laughs> And the sheriff never gave you any direction on this? No. So all you know about the enforcement of this order is what you're reading here? Uh, basically, yes. And when you granted permission, aside from contacting the bailiff, did you any, any, get any sort of documentation? No, I did not. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Any uh, questions for the witness? Uh, just a few, uh, general. Good afternoon, uh, Tim Uh, you did indicate that, uh, uh you, uh, would ask a deputy to, if you, uh, were made aware, uh, of a request that had been granted to, uh, appear in court, uh, to come into court, that, uh, you'd ask a deputy to, uh, stay. Correct. Uh, is that a uh, 
Is that something that would have been out, out of the ordinary? And, and what I mean by that is, are there many instances where there are no deputies in the uh, sheriff's office because they are all out doing other tasks? Yes, it's, it's frequently there's only one deputy left behind to observe the prisoners in the cell. Um, because I'm the lieutenant, I do a lot of paperwork, and I wind up staying behind frequently. The other nine deputies will take off and serve papers, transport prisoners. So. <coughs> so, in the instances where you knew that permission had been granted to uh, here to come into the building, uh, does that mean that uh, you would have had, in effect, two deputies? If, if they were prisoners there, you obviously need to have one deputy there to observe the prisoners. <coughs> so you would have asked another deputy to stay in case they were needed. Yes, I just ask them to either stay in the area, be close to the keen area, or if they have something to do at the office, to not do the papers now, to stay in the office and do a report or whatever, just to stick around the office or stay right there, maybe in a keen area. Okay. So uh, you did uh, make uh, changes to staffing, uh, to normal staffing procedures? Well, on certain times, yes, I would. Okay. Um, So, um, my understanding from your response to cross examination is that you would, if you receive notice of an exam in the courthouse, you would ask one deputy to stay close to the area. Is that right? There's a lot of things that went that, uh, that go into making that decision. Um, depending on what kind of case it's a, what's happening, how many people are going to be upstairs in the courtroom. I might just ask a deputy. Uh, most of the people here that I work with are friends of mine, so I'd say, you want to just stay in the area. Either that or just do your report here for the time being, and then when you're done, head on out onto the road. So, I guess I was, I was really anticipating my next question, which was how long were you going to ask him to stay here? And you said you'd ask him to stay there for the time. Of the uh, usually I'd wait until the case is upstairs were completed and then they would be I'd tell them they could finish up or head on out. Well, you also said that you would ask them to stay close to the community area. Right? So if there's nobody at the courthouse, you just say stay. You would call the company the courthouse and say stay close to the community area. Just be in the key area so if I need to call. Well, with nine deputies, isn't it likely that you're going to have multiple deputies close to the community area? We only have one deputy that serves the Keene area. We have deputies that serve all the rest of the county, so they deputies in Ringe, deputies in uh, down in Hinsdale, deputies in Walpole, deputies in Nelson. Or so Star. all those deputies are stationed, right? Right. Everybody's stationed out of the sheriff's office. Right. They may go to Ringe, they may go to Walpole, they may go. Correct. Now you said you had people you want someone to stay close to the Keene area. Um, did you ever you will call somebody actually come into the courthouse because you were received notice of somebody coming in? Uh, the, I'm sorry, because I received notice that somebody was, did I ever call anybody in? No. Thank you. Mr. Before the no trespass order, did you have to, uh, were there instances where you had to have uh, numerous deputies uh, outside? Yes. And I was actually called in from different locations to come to you. And roughly how frequently did that happen prior to the serving of the no trespass order? I couldn't tell you. I, I would say I've done it about three times before this, uh, this no trespass order was put into effect. Nothing further. Just to follow up on that, you're referring to being called to come to the parking lot? Come to the sheriff's office, not necessarily to the parking lot, but to respond to the sheriff's office. For what reason? Uh, 
uh, because there was a disturbance someplace within the building, someplace in the parking lot, um, someplace out in front of the building. Um, we've had disturbances in the hallways, disturbances in the parking lot. Um, these were disturbances. Um, there have been raised voices, um, some name calling. Has, has anybody ever been arrested? I've never arrested anybody in the park. Have there been any violations of the law? In the parking lot? Yeah. I have never arrested anybody for any violations in the park. Well, are you aware of any, any violations of the law in the parking lot? People have been arrested? I am not aware of any. Thank you, Eric. Nothing further to say, Your Honor. Thank you. Just, uh, I should have asked this in the previous witness, but I assume the answer is obvious, but I'm going to just make sure. Uh, the, the trespass letter says talks about legitimate county business. The, the, the building is a multi purpose building. There's right. two state courts in there, the Superior Court and the Probate Court. Uh, there's a county office with the county attorney's office, and there's the Women's Crisis, or the, uh, the crisis Center. Right. So, but that, in your, at least your interpretation, does that cover any, pur any purpose in any of those offices? That might that be correct. Based on that, do you have any other questions? Um, nothing further. Okay, say, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Your Honor, um, the defendant's calling you for a minute. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please raise your right hand. You square affirm anything you say here be the truth? I affirm, I'll tell the truth. Thank you. Have a seat. And you've heard the testimony about um, a group of people um, in the parking lot with court personnel. Now, have you ever been in the parking lot with court personnel? Yes. Approximately how many times? Several. Um, maybe five to seven. And what's the time frame when this occurred? It's all the, uh, around the last week of the year of 2011. And um, to your knowledge, have there been any other any other um, protests in the parking lot that have occurred since that time? Well, and before, or before or since that time? Not that I can recall. Now, um, just speaking for yourself, what was your purpose in being in the parking lot? The reason I was there was to ask some questions of the court employees because uh, as a member of the media it's impossible to get anyone on the record inside the courthouse inside the building itself uh, because of camera restrictions that have been in place for the, uh, the court lobby so I wanted to ask questions of court personnel on the record being that you know they're public employees so they should be able to be on the record when they're on the job unfortunately I'm unable to ask those questions inside the building due to prevention of me using recording devices. So the only other place to ask those questions would be outside the building when those people were leaving. We also, since it was the holiday season, turned it into kind of a multi-purpose event where questions were being asked, but carols were also being sung, and happy holidays and Merry Christmas were being wished. Now, you heard testimony from the sheriff that people were getting with it six inches of court personnel. Um, is that true from your observation? Uh, not in my experience, and I was there for, for every one of those <coughs> those events in the parking lot. And, and approximately, what's the closest you ever got to individual court? Certainly nowhere in anyone's personal space. Uh, the other testimony was five to six feet away. That sounds about right. I mean, if somebody was any closer to me, that's because they would have walked past me and I would have been you know, in the parking lot. Like, it wouldn't have been a purposeful approach or anything like that. Did you or anybody else to your observation ever make any type of verbal or nonverbal threat of, of violence or any other type of threat of physical contact? Certainly not, and I think that uh, the experience this board has had with uh, my friends and I is that we are certainly very peaceful folks. Uh, did you ever um, make any threats 
towards any court personnel in the park? Absolutely not. The trucks or no way. Unless Merry Christmas is a threat or Happy Holidays. Thank you. No further questions. Thank you. Mr. Bernard, you indicated that your purpose was to ask questions of court employees. Uh, what sort of questions were you asking? Could you call me Mr. Freeman? Uh, no, uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Bernard, I will not. Well, I would have settled on Ian for the purposes of this uh, testimony. Ian, can you grasp uh, that again? What, uh, what was the purpose, uh, what, was, what were the questions that you were asking? We were uh, inquiring regarding how the court employees felt uh, about one of their co-workers, uh, in this case, uh, bailiff, Mr. Tebow, uh, dragging one of our friends across the floor by, by the handcuffs after he had been arrested. You're asking how they felt about that. And uh, uh, what other questions uh, would you have been asking? Um, that was the primary thrust of the questions. Anything else in particular I don't recall. Uh, and you referred to... That was the reason why we had come out, was because of the violence of the court bailiffs. That was what uh, was our incentive to be there. Uh, you indicated that you were singing uh, when you described this Christmas carol. Uh, you heard uh, prior testimony that the may have been the music of Christmas carols, but they were not traditional Christmas carols, uh, in that the words were different. Is that correct? Yes, we call them chronic carols. They are a couple, of them, most of them were songs that were taken the classic Christmas tunes and replaced the lyrics with essentially lyrics uh, to oppose the insane war on drugs. So, for instance, uh, you know, they, they would focus on, let's see, drug war cops are raiding the school is, is one of the, the songs that we sang. Uh, did you uh, ever have any songs that related specifically to employees at the court? Later on in that particular window of time, there was one song uh, that was directed that had lyrics with a modified uh, lyric of Tebow to have to do with the court uh, security officer who was particularly violent and rude towards people. Mm -hmm. uh, so there was one song in particular. Do you remember what the words were? Tebow, 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 Bag Tebow Baggins, I believe it was. Uh, the lyrics are online, but uh, it was a takeoff of an old uh, Leonard Nimoy song about Bilbo Baggins from the uh, his, his series of books, the Lord of the Rings, <coughs> Lord of the Rings series. as a member of the media attempting to hold government employees accountable to be concerned with how they feel about the questions that I ask to hold them accountable. As, a, you know, as public employees, they should be subject to uh, people asking them questions about their job. Uh, does that include uh, being subject to, uh, for instance, uh, uh, having a license plate uh, videotape? I think that if you're a person in a public place, especially uh, public workers, then you're subject to being recorded. I mean, there's plenty of case law that, uh, in court decisions like the Glick decision out of Boston that recently made it very clear that all public employees uh, are subject to being recorded uh, while they're in the course of their public duties. And in this case, because I couldn't go into the courthouse property to the actual courthouse building to record these employees, recording them on their way to and from their cars was the only other option. But they're no longer in the course of their public duties, would 
wouldn't you agree? Well, that doesn't matter. They're in the public uh, view, and anyone is a, that's out in public is subject to being recorded. Okay, but you would admit, you would agree, that after 4 o'clock and, uh, you know, before they uh, walk into the building, they're officially not, you know, in the con they're not working, they're no longer working in the context of being a public employee. I don't know how um, those things are defined. To me, they are always, like, I am a talk show host by profession, and even though I'm not sitting in my studio right now, I'm subject to being asked questions by anyone who wants to ask uh, about what my job is or what it is that I do for a living. I'm always a talk show host, and similarly, these people are always government employees. If they don't want to be uh, answer the questions, they can just walk right on by. And when they walked on by, uh, did, what, uh, did you continue asking questions? Well, not all of them walked by. We actually had uh, pleasant conversations with a number of them. You haven't called those folks in, but the video footage that we recorded recorded those conversations, include one of the, including one of the judges uh, from the courthouse, I believe, because he was parking in a judge space, who had very kind things to say about us and our right to be able to record and hold people accountable. I didn't answer your question, though. Can you rephrase it? I think you answered it. Okay. Okay. Alright, so where do we go from here? Okay, uh, the state has uh, just um, uh, three further witnesses, Your Honor, and they should be uh, relatively short. Uh, the state would call uh, Jennifer. Good afternoon. Uh, do you recall a, um, a period of time at the end of 2011 when uh, the defendant and others were outside in the parking lot upon uh, uh, the morning hours when arriving to work and in the evening, uh, late afternoon when you were leaving work. Yes. But just just for the record, you're going to have two, two defendants. Perhaps you better just identify the better. Uh, when Ian, uh, Ian Bernard and Lynn Saraski were uh, in the parking lot. And yes. Thank you. Uh, When were you primarily um, faced uh, with them? Was it in the morning or the afternoon? Actually, in the morning I was warned, so I purposely parked in a different spot and walked in through the front door because I was called and told to park somewhere different. And then in the af after work is when they were at the door waiting for us. Okay. Um, how did you feel having to park at a different location, having to be warned that you'd have to um, face, um, face that in the morning? It was frustrating and upsetting. And um, in the afternoon, uh, when you left, you indicated that you left with your co-workers. Uh, what, uh, uh, what was going on that uh, made you feel that uh, you should leave with your coworkers? Because uh, they were videoing and asking questions and getting up in our, getting up close to us. How close? Well, when I actually, we had a deputy that was out there a the couple of times. I was on vacation for 
a lot of it. So the few times that I went out, it wasn't as bad because um, there was a deputy well, that we were trying to keep. I would just, just for hearsay purposes here, ask the witness I'm, just I'm, to I'm speak filtering. to I'm filtering it. Okay. Just try to keep your answers to what you know specifically, unless you're asked a different kind of question. And you can be Thank you. Um, so, uh, how close did they get to you when you uh, were being? They were just waiting for us at the bottom of the stairs. And then we would pass them. And then once we would start going to our cars, they didn't follow us to our cars. Okay. The days that I was involved. On the days you were involved, they didn't follow you to your cars. Did, did you, uh, when you left, how close were they? Were they a foot from you, two feet, six feet? I mean, they were, when I passed them, they were right next to me. I mean, right, I could touch them. Okay. And uh, how did that make you feel, being that close, being that close to them? Uncomfortable. Okay. Um, did you have any get better after the uh, no trespass order was served? Yes. And how did, how did it change that for you? Um, we didn't have to really worry about coming into work or leaving work, being harassed or bothered. Does everybody leave the clerk's office at the same time? Not normally. You've indicated, though, that you left this group. Does that mean that when this was going on, your, the normal operation of the clerk's office had to change and people had to leave at the same time? Or did leave at the same time? Yeah, because actually I got stuck at waiting on someone at the window one day, and we actually, everyone still waited for me, and we all left as a group. Okay, so it would be fair to say that it did, um, the activities uh, did impact on the normal operation of the uh, Jackson, uh, uh, Okay. Did How did the how did having everybody have to leave at the same time affect the operation of the court of the clerk's office? And we had to wait for everyone to make sure everyone was ready before we left. From your perspective, uh, was that, uh, uh, let's start that. Uh, do you remember questions that you were being asked when you left? Not really. I tried to just kind of block it out. Maybe nothing further, Your Honor. No, that's all right. Yeah, Your Honor, I have no questions. Thank you. Thank you. You still have to keep my testimony to yourself here for, for a while, but you don't know, have to go back to work. Uh, stay with Cole Pan.
Yes. 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 Yes
I know they were just at the bottom of the steps south back of the courthouse, but they were not that close to me. Okay. Thank you very much, Joe. Uh, sure. No further questions from the state. And no questions. Okay, you're all set. Can't discuss your testimony yet, but uh, you're all set to go back to work. Thank you. Thank you. And the uh, state has uh, no further witnesses. Okay. Do you think to add for this afternoon? Yeah, no, we have uh, no further, uh, there's no rebuttal testimony witnesses. I, I said I would like, just because there's some new legal issues to address here, I would like an opportunity just to respond to that with some sort of legal memory. Okay. Are you going to be doing the same, or? Uh, state might, it depends on, on some degree on what right. I mean, the issue is pretty much squarely presented, correct? I mean, uh, yes, and the uh, state's, um, uh, and a lot of the state's argument also is included in its uh, pleading, uh, which was the state's answer and objection to the defendant's yeah. motion to dismiss. Yeah, I guess how much time? Okay. Could probably 10 days on it. Sure. Do you mean 10 days would be enough? Yes. Okay, and then... Uh, so, the, so the issue is whether, uh, I guess the issue is whether just the, the strict reading of the elements of the offense is all the state really had to show here, and you say that, 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 that we have to get behind that with respect to the validity of the order. Well, well, well I, I, I guess, I guess that, that's, that's the issue that's been, that's the issue that's been raised right. today. Uh, I, I think the, we're still, I mean, I think still before the court is our basic argument that right. the, that the statute is unconstitutional. I think some of the testimony today does bear on that. So I mean, that, that's what we have our primary focus. Um, and did you need, are you going to supplement the constitutional question, do you think? Yeah. Well, I, I, think, I think it's more a matter of, of, of applying, now, now that we have a factual record, which we didn't have before. So this applying, is an as-applied case? Yeah, basically applying the, the um, I mean, I was thinking of as applied in this and, and on its face as being related to statutory issues. So this is sort of a little bit different, but. I, I just may need, may need help from both of you just to, just to make sure I, I'm addressing it the way that you think of it. Because I know, I want to make sure I understand how each of you wants me to address that. I mean, my argument, again, the defendant's position is, is essentially that the order violates their constitutional rights. Um, and that that um, that makes the makes the makes the trespass prosecution um, also a violation of the rights because the prosecution is predicated on that order. Um, and um, it, it's sort of an unusual trespassing order because the state is now arguing today. That they weren't really banned in the first place. They just had to get permission. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm not sure. Maybe an issue there whether it even is a you know, trespass violation because the order is not a not a complete ban order for them. Yeah, look at that. Mm -hmm. So ten days would be enough. Uh, that would be uh, sufficient. Yeah, maybe two weeks. We could get two weeks. That would sure. Be. Actually, you know, given the, the holidays and vacations. I'm not going to be getting to this, unfortunately, right away. So, so, so if you want a little bit more time, I'll give you more time. Maybe what I can do is just discuss that with David, and then we'll get to the court of David. Just, just let the clerk know when, when we can expect. Very good. Thank Thanks. you, Your Honor. Thank you, Your Honor. All right. I know. All the all sheriff that has to do is say sorry, yeah. and this whole thing will be done. Like I made a mistake. I, you know, overstepped the bounds. We'd like to invite you to visit freekeen.com. Freekeen.com features audio, video, and blogs chronicling the transition to a voluntary society. Freekeen.com also has comments and discussion forums so you can be heard. Freekeen.com. I should be in Keene, New Hampshire with the Free Staters.